Chapter Sixteen of Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Ten. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Ten, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter Sixteen: The Morning Pageant recounting the fate of these wretched malefactors has led us far afield we will now return to the morning of the fifteenth of april and sketch in brief and wholly inadequate words the honors which the nation paid to its dead the appalling news spread quickly over the country millions of citizens learned at their breakfast tables that the president had been shot and was dying and two hours after his death when a squad of soldiers were escorting his mortal remains to the executive mansion the dreadful fact was known at all the great centres of population this was the first time the telegraph had been called upon to spread over the world tidings of such deep and mournful significance it was therefore the first time the entire people of the united states had been called to deplore the passing away of an idolized leader even before his body was cold in death the news fell with peculiar severity upon the hearts which were glowing with the joy of a great victory for the last four days in every city and hamlet of the land the people were breaking forth into unusual and fantastic expressions of gaiety and content bonfires flamed through the nights the days were uproarious with the firing of guns the streets were hung with flags and wreaths and whatever decorations could be on the instant improvised by a people not especially gifted with the scenic sense and committees were everywhere forming to arrange for elaborate and official functions of joy upon this mirth and expansion the awful intelligence from washington fell with a crushing and stunning effect of an unspeakable calamity in the sudden rigor of this unexpected misfortune the country lost sight of the vast national success of the past week and it thus came to pass that there was never any organized expression of the general exultation or rejoicing in the north over the downfall of the rebellion it was unquestionably best that it should be so and lincoln himself would not have had it otherwise he hated the arrogance of triumph and even in his cruel death he would have been glad to know that his passage to eternity would prevent too loud an exultation over the vanquished as it was the south could take no umbrage at a grief so genuine and so legitimate the people of that section even shared to a certain degree in the lamentations over the bier of one whom in their utmost hearts they knew to have wished them well there was one exception to the general grief too remarkable to be passed over in silence among the extreme radicals in congress mr lincoln's determined clemency and liberality towards the southern people had made an impression so unfavorable that though they were naturally shocked at his murder they did not among themselves conceal their gratification that he was no longer in their way in a political caucus held a few hours after the president's death they resolved on an entire change of the cabinet and a line of policy less conciliatory than that of mr lincoln the feeling was nearly universal we are using the language of one of their most prominent representatives that the accession of johnson to the presidency would prove a godsend to the country the next day the committee on the conduct of the war called on the new president and senator wade bluntly expressed to him the feeling of his associates johnson we have faith in you by the gods there will be no trouble now in running the government before many months passed away they had opportunity to learn that violence of speech was no guarantee of political consistency 
in washington with this singular exception the manifestation of the public grief was immediate and demonstrative the insignia of rejoicing at once disappeared and within an hour after the body of the president was taken to the white house the town was shrouded in black not only the public buildings the stores and shops and the better class of residences were draped in funeral decorations but a still more touching proof of the affection with which the dead man was regarded was seen in the poorest class of houses where the laboring men of both colors found means in their penury to afford some scanty show of mourning the interest and the veneration of the people still centered in the white house where under a tall catafalque in the east room the late chief of state lay in the majesty of death and not at the modest tavern on pennsylvania avenue where the new president had his lodging at eleven o'clock chief justice chase administered the oath of office to andrew johnson in the presence of a few witnesses he immediately summoned the cabinet for a brief meeting william hunter was appointed acting secretary of state during the interim of the disability of mr seward and his son and directed to communicate to the country and the world the change in the head of the government brought about by the last night's crime it was determined that the funeral ceremonies in washington should be celebrated on wednesday the nineteenth of april and all the churches throughout the country were invited to join at the same time in solemnizing the occasion by appropriate observances all of the pomp and circumstance which the government could command was employed to give a fitting escort from the white house to the capitol where the body of the president was to lie in state a splendidly appointed force of cavalry artillery and infantry formed the greater part of the procession which was completed by delegations from illinois and kentucky as mourners the new president the cabinet the ministers of foreign powers and all the high officers of the nation legislative judicial and executive the pallbearers comprised the leading members of both houses of congress and the officers of the highest rank in the army and navy the ceremonies in the east room were brief and simple the rev dr hall of the church of the epiphany read the burial service bishop simpson of the methodist church distinguished equally for his eloquence and his patriotism offered a prayer and the rev dr p d Gurley, at whose church the president and his family habitually attended worship delivered a short address commemorating in language notably free from courtly flattery the qualities of courage purity and sublime faith which had made the dead men great and useful the coffin was carried to the funeral car and the vast procession moved to the capitol amid the tolling of all the bells in washington georgetown and alexandria and the booming of minute guns at lafayette square at the city hall and on capitol hill to associate the pomp of the day with the greatest work of lincoln's life a detachment of colored troops marched at the head of the line in the rotunda under the soaring dome of the capitol the coffin rested during the day and night of the nineteenth and until the evening of the next day the people passed by in thousands to gaze on the face of the liberator which had taken on in death an expression of profound happiness and repose like that so often seen on the features of soldiers shot dead in battle it had been decided from the first that lincoln was to be buried at springfield whenever a president dies whose personality more than his office has endeared him to the people it is proposed that his body shall rest at washington but the better instinct of the country no less than the natural feelings of the family insist that his dust shall lie among his own neighbors and kin it is fitting that washington shall sleep at mount vernon the adamses at quincy that even harrison and taylor and garfield though they died in office should be conveyed to the bosom of the states which had cherished them and sent them to the service of the nation so illinois claimed her greatest citizen for final sepulture amid the scenes which witnessed the growth and development of his unique character the town of springfield set apart a lovely spot in its northern suburb for his grave 
and appropriated twenty thousand dollars a large sum considering the size and wealth of the town to defray the expenses of his funeral as soon as it was announced that he was to be buried in illinois every town and city on the route begged that the train might halt within its limits and give its people the opportunity of testifying their grief and their reverence it was finally arranged that the funeral cortege should follow substantially the same route over which lincoln had come in eighteen sixty one to take possession of the office to which he had given a new dignity and value for all time governor john bro of ohio and john w garrett of baltimore were placed in general charge of the solemn journey a guard of honor consisting of a dozen officers of high rank in the army and navy was detailed by their respective departments which received the remains of the president at the station in washington at eight o'clock on the morning of friday the twenty first of april and the train decked in sombre trappings moved out towards baltimore in this city through which four years before it was a question whether the president-elect could pass with safety to his life the train made a halt the coffin was taken with sacred care to the great dome of the exchange and there surrounded by evergreens and lilies it lay for several hours the people passing by in mournful throngs night was closing in with rain and wind when the train reached harrisburg and the coffin was carried through the muddy streets to the state capitol where the next morning the same scenes of grief and affection were seen we need not enumerate the many stopping places of this dolorous pageant the same demonstration was repeated gaining continually an intensity of feeling and solemn splendor of display in every city through which the procession passed at philadelphia a vast concourse accompanied the dead president to independence hall he had shown himself worthy of the lofty fate he courted when on that hallowed spot on the birthday of washington eighteen sixty one he had said he would rather be assassinated than give up the principles embodied in the declaration of independence here as at many other places the most touching manifestations of loving remembrance came from the poor who brought flowers twined by themselves to lay upon the coffin the reception at new york was worthy alike of the great city and of the memory of the man they honored the body lay in state in the city hall and a half a million people passed in deep silence before it here general scott came pale and feeble but resolute to pay his tribute of respect to his departed friend and commander the train went up the hudson river by night and at every town and village on the way vast crowds were revealed in waiting by the fitful glare of torches dirges and hymns were sung as the train moved by midnight had passed when the coffin was borne to the capitol at albany yet the multitude rushed in as if it were day and for twelve hours the long line of people from northern new york and the neighboring states poured through the room over the broad spaces of new york the cortege made its way through one continuous crowd of mourners at syracuse thirty thousand people came out in a storm at midnight to greet the passing train with fires and bells and cannons at rochester the same solemn observances made the night memorable at buffalo it was now the morning of the twenty seventh the body lay in state at st james hall visited by a multitude from the western counties as the train passed into ohio the crowds increased in density and the public grief seemed intensified at every step westward the people of the great central basin seemed to be claiming their own the day spent at cleveland was unexampled in the depth of emotion it brought to life the warm devotion to the memory of the great man gone which was exhibited some of the guard of honor have said that it was at that point they began to appreciate the place which lincoln was to hold in history the authorities seeing that no building would accommodate the crowd which was sure to come from all over the state 
wisely erected in the public square an imposing mortuary tabernacle for the lying in state brilliant with evergreens and flowers by day and innumerable gas jets by night and surmounted by the inscription extinctus amabitur idem impressive religious ceremonies were conducted in the square by bishop McIlvaine, and an immense procession moved to the station at night between two lines of torchlights columbus and indianapolis the state capitals of ohio and indiana were next visited the whole state in each case seemed gathered to meet their dead hero an intense personal regard was everywhere evident it was the man not the ruler they appeared to be celebrating the banners and scrolls bore principally his own words with malice towards none with charity for all the purposes of the lord are perfect and must prevail here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain and other brief passages from his writings on arriving in chicago on the first of may amid a scene of magnificent mourning the body was borne to the courthouse where it lay for two days under a canopy of sombre richness inscribed with that noble hebrew lament the beauty of israel is slain upon thy high places from all the states of the northwest an innumerable throng poured for those two days into chicago and flowed a mighty stream of humanity past the coffin of the dead president in the midst of evidences of deep and universal grief which was all the more genuine for being quiet and reserved the last stage of this extraordinary progress was the journey to springfield which began on the night of the second of may and ended at nine o'clock the next morning the schedule made in washington twelve days before having been accurately carried out on all the railroads centering in springfield the trains for several days had been crowded to their utmost capacity with people who desired to see the last of abraham lincoln upon earth nothing had been done or thought of for two weeks in springfield but the preparations for this day they were made with a thoroughness which surprised the visitors from the east the body lay in state in the capitol which was richly draped from roof to basement in black velvet and silver fringe within it was a bower of bloom and fragrance for twenty-four hours an unbroken stream of people passed through bidding their friend and neighbor welcome home and farewell and at ten o'clock on the fourth of may the coffin lid was closed at last and a vast procession moved out to oak ridge where the dead president was committed to the soil of the state which had so loved and honored him the ceremonies at the grave were simple and touching bishop simpson delivered a pathetic oration prayers were offered and hymns were sung but the weightiest and most eloquent words uttered anywhere that day were those of the second inaugural which the committee had wisely ordained to be read over his grave as the friends of raphael chose the incomparable canvas of the transfiguration as the chief ornament of his funeral an association was immediately formed to build a monument over the grave of lincoln the work was in the hands of his best and oldest friends in illinois and was pushed with vigor few large subscriptions were received with the exception of fifty thousand dollars voted by the state of illinois and ten thousand dollars by new york but innumerable small contributions afforded all that was needed the soldiers and sailors of the nation gave twenty eight thousand dollars of which the disproportionately large amount of eight thousand dollars was the gift of the negro troops whose manhood lincoln had recognized by putting arms in their hands 
in all a hundred and eighty thousand dollars was raised and the monument built after a design by larkin g meade was dedicated on the fifteenth of october eighteen seventy four the day was fine the concourse of people was enormous there were music and eloquence and a brilliant decorative display the orator of the day was general richard j oglesby who praised his friend with warm but sober eulogy general sherman added his honest and hearty tribute and general grant twice elected president uttered these carefully chosen words which had all the weight that belongs to the rare discourses of that candid and reticent soldier from march eighteen sixty four to the day when the hand of the assassin opened a grave for mr lincoln then president of the united states my personal relations with him were as close and intimate as the nature of our respective duties would permit to know him personally was to love and respect him for his great qualities of heart and head and for his patience and patriotism with all his disappointments from failures on the part of those to whom he had entrusted commands and treachery on the part of those who had gained his confidence but to betray it i never heard him utter a complaint nor cast a censure for bad conduct or bad faith it was his nature to find excuses for his adversaries in his death the nation lost its greatest hero in his death the south lost its most just friend End of chapter 16. Recording by John Brandon. Chapter 17 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org abraham lincoln a history volume ten by john hay and john george nicolay chapter seventeen the end of rebellion in the early years of the war after every considerable success of the national arms the newspapers were in the habit of announcing that the back of the rebellion was broken but at last the time came when the phrase was true after appomattox the rebellion fell to pieces all at once lee surrendered less than one-sixth of the confederates in arms on the ninth of april the armies that still remained to them though inconsiderable when compared with the mighty host under the national colors were yet infinitely larger than any washington had commanded and were capable of strenuous resistance and of incalculable mischief leading minds on both sides thought the war might be indefinitely prolonged we have seen that jefferson davis after richmond fell issued his swelling manifesto saying the confederates had now entered upon a new phase of the struggle and that he would never consent to abandon to the enemy one foot of the soil of any of the states of the confederacy general sherman so late as the twenty fifth of april said i now apprehend that the rebel armies will disperse and instead of dealing with six or seven states we will have to deal with numberless bands of desperadoes neither side comprehended fully the intense weariness of war that had taken possession of the south and peace came more swiftly and completely than any one had ever dared to hope the march of sherman from atlanta to the sea and his northward progress through the carolinas had predisposed the great interior region to make an end of strife a tendency which was greatly promoted by wilson's energetic and masterly raid the rough usage received by taylor and by forrest at his hands and the blow their dignity suffered in the chase of their fugitive president made their surrender more practicable an officer of taylor's staff came to canby's headquarters on the nineteenth of april to make arrangements for the surrender of all the confederate forces east of the mississippi not already paroled by sherman and by wilson 
embracing some forty-two thousand men on the fourth of may the terms were agreed upon and signed at the village of citronelle in alabama general taylor gives a picturesque incident of his meeting with general canby the union officers invited the confederates to a luncheon and while the latter were enjoying a menu to which they had long been unaccustomed the military band in attendance began playing hail columbia canby with a courtesy taylor says equal to anything recorded by froissart excused himself and walked to the door the music ceased for a moment and then the air of dixie was heard the confederates not to be left in arrears of good breeding then demanded the national air and the flag of the reunited country was toasted by both sides the terms agreed upon were those accorded by grant to lee with slight changes of detail the united states government furnishing transportation and subsistence on the way home to the men lately engaged in the effort to destroy it the confederates willingly testify to the cordial generosity with which they were treated public property says general taylor was turned over and receded for and this as orderly and quickly as in time of peace between officers of the same service at the same time and place the confederate commodore ebenezer ferrand surrendered to rear-admiral henry k thatcher all the naval forces of the confederacy in the neighborhood of mobile a dozen vessels and some hundreds of officers general e kirby smith commanded all the insurgent forces west of the mississippi on him the desperate hopes of mr davis and his flying cabinet were fixed after the successive surrenders of lee and johnston had left them no prospect in the east they imagined they could move westward gathering up stragglers as they fled and crossing the river could join smith's forces and form an army which in that portion of the country abounding in supplies and deficient in rivers and railroads could have continued the war to this hope adds mr davis i persistently clung smith on the twenty first of april called upon his soldiers to continue the fight you possess the means of long resisting invasion you have hopes of succor from abroad the great resources of this department its vast extent the numbers the discipline and the efficiency of the army will secure to our country terms that a proud people can with honor accept and may under the providence of god be the means of checking the triumph of our enemy and securing the final success of our cause the attitude of smith seemed so threatening that sheridan was sent from washington to bring him to reason but he did not long hold his position of solitary defiance one more needless skirmish took place near brazos and then smith followed the example of taylor and surrendered his entire force some eighteen thousand to general canby on the twenty sixth of may the same generous terms were accorded him that had been given to taylor the government fed his troops and carried them to their homes meanwhile general wilson had been paroling many thousands of prisoners who wandered in straggling parties within the limits of his command one hundred and seventy-five thousand men in all were surrendered by the different confederate commanders and there were in addition to these about ninety-nine thousand prisoners in national custody during the year one-third of these were exchanged and two-thirds released this was done as rapidly as possible by successive orders of the war department beginning on the ninth of may and continuing through the summer the first object of the government was to stop the waste of war recruiting ceased immediately after lee's surrender the purchase of arms and supplies was curtailed and measures were taken to reduce as promptly as possible the vast military establishment it had grown during the last few months to portentous dimensions the impression that a great and final victory was near at hand the stimulus of the national hope the prospect of a brief and prosperous campaign had brought the army up to the magnificent complement of a million men the reduction of this vast armament the retrenchment of the enormous expenses 
incident to it were immediately undertaken with a method and dispatch which were the result of four years thorough and practical training and which would have been impossible under any other circumstances every chief of bureau was ordered on the twenty eighth of april to proceed at once to the reduction of expenses in his department to a peace footing and this before taylor or smith had surrendered and while jefferson davis was still at large the transportation department gave up the railroads of the south to their owners mainly in better condition than that in which they had been received they began without delay to sell the immense accumulation of draft animals eight million dollars were realized from that source within the year the other departments also disposed of their surplus stores the stupendous difference which the close of the war at once caused in the finances of the country may be seen in the fact that the appropriations for the army in the fiscal year succeeding the war were thirty three million eight hundred and fourteen thousand four hundred and sixty one dollars as against five hundred and sixteen million two hundred and forty thousand one hundred and thirty one dollars for the preceding year the army of a million men was brought down with incredible ease and celerity to one of twenty five thousand before the great army melted away into the greater body of citizens the soldiers enjoyed one final triumph a march through the capital undisturbed by death or danger under the eyes of their highest commanders military and civilian and the representatives of the people whose nationality they had saved the army of the potomac and the army of sherman such corps of them as were stationed within reach waiting their discharge were ordered to pass in review before general grant and president johnson in front of the executive mansion on the twenty third and twenty fourth of may those who witnessed this solemn yet joyous pageant will never forget it and will pray that their children may never witness anything like it for two whole days this formidable host eight times the number of the entire peace establishment marched the long stretch of pennsylvania avenue starting from the shadow of the dome of the capitol and filling that wide thoroughfare to georgetown with their serried mass moving with the easy yet rapid pace of veterans in cadence step on a platform in front of the white house stood the president and all the first officers of the state the judges of the highest court the most eminent generals and admirals of the army and the navy the weather on both days was the finest a washington may could afford the trees of lafayette square were leafing out in their strong and delicate verdure the army of the potomac which for four years had been the living bulwark of the capital was rightly given the precedence meade himself rode at the head of his column then came the cavalry headed by merritt sheridan having already started for his new command in the southwest custer commanding the third division had an opportunity of displaying his splendid horsemanship as his charger excited beyond control by the pomp and martial music bolted near the treasury and dashed with the speed of the wind past the reviewing stand but was soon mastered by the young general who was greeted with stormy applause as he rode gravely by the second time covered with garlands of flowers the gifts of friends on the pavement the same graceful guerdon was given all the leading commanders even subalterns and hundreds of private soldiers marched decked with these fragrant offerings the three infantry corps the ninth under park the fifth under griffin though warren was on the stand hailed with tumultuous cheers by his soldiers and the second under humphreys moved swiftly forward wright with the sixth was too far away to join in the day's parade the memory of hundreds of hard-fought battles of saddening defeats and glorious victories of the dead and maimed comrades who had fallen forever out of the thinned ranks was present to every one who saw the veteran divisions marching by under the charge of generals who had served with them in every vicissitude of battle and siege trained officers like crook and Ayres, and young and brilliant soldiers who had risen like rockets from among the volunteers such as barlow and miles every brigade had its days of immortal prowess to boast every tattered guerdon had its history on the twenty fourth sherman's army marched in review 
the general rode in person at the head of his troops and was received by the dense multitude that thronged the avenue with a tumult of rapturous plaudits which might have assured him of the peculiar place he was to hold thereafter in the hearts of his fellow-citizens he and his horse were loaded with flowers and his principal commanders were not neglected howard had just been appointed chief of the freedmen's bureau and therefore logan commanded the right wing of the army of the tennessee the place he had hoped for and his friends insist deserved when mcpherson fell hazen had succeeded to the fifteenth corps and frank blair a chivalrous and martial figure rode at the head of the seventeenth slocum led the left wing the army of georgia consisting of the twentieth corps under mower and the fourteenth under j c davis the armies of meade and sherman were not exclusively from the east and west respectively for sherman had the contingent which hooker and howard had brought to chattanooga from the east and there were regiments from as far west as wisconsin and minnesota in the army of the potomac but sherman's troops were to all intents and purposes western men and they were scanned with keen and hospitable interest by the vast crowd of spectators who were mainly from the east there was little to choose between the two armies a trifle more of neatness and discipline perhaps among the veterans of meade a slight preponderance in physique and in swinging vigor of march among the westerners but the trivial differences were lost in the immense and evident likeness as of brothers in one family there was a touch of the grotesque in the march of sherman's legions which was absent from the well-ordered corps of meade a small squad of bummers followed each brigade in their characteristic garb and accessories small donkeys loaded with queer spoils goats and game cocks regimental pets sitting gravely on the backs of mules and piccaninnies the adopted children of companies showed their black faces between the ranks their eyes and teeth gleaming with delight as a mere spectacle this march of the mightiest host the continent has ever seen gathered together was grand and imposing but it was not as a spectacle alone that it affected the beholder most deeply it was not a mere holiday parade it was an army of citizens on their way home after a long and terrible war their clothes were worn with toilsome marches and pierced with bullets their banners had been torn with shot and shell and lashed in the winds of a thousand battles the very drums and fifes that played the ruffles as each battalion passed the president had called out the troops to numberless night alarms had sounded the onset at vicksburg and antietam had inspired the wasted valor of kennesaw and fredericksburg had throbbed with the electric pulse of victory at chattanooga and five forks the whole country claimed these heroes as a part of themselves an infinite gratification for ever to the national self-love and the thoughtful diplomatists who looked on the scene from the reviewing stand could not help seeing that there was a conservative force in an intelligent democracy which the world had never before known with all the shouting and the laughter and the joy of this unprecedented ceremony there was one sad and dominant thought which could not be driven from the minds of those who saw it that of the men who were absent and who had nevertheless richly earned the right to be there the soldiers in their shrunken companies were conscious of the ever-present memories of the brave comrades who had fallen by the way and in the whole army there was the passionate and unavailing regret that their wise gentle and powerful friend abraham lincoln was gone for ever from the house by the avenue where their loyal votes supporting their loyal bayonets had contributed so much to place him the world has had many lessons to learn from this great war the naval fight in hampton roads opened a new era in maritime warfare the marches of sherman disturbed all previous axioms of logistics the system of instantaneous entrenchments adopted by the soldiers of both sides in the latter part of the war changed the whole character of modern field tactics but the greatest of all the lessons afforded to humanity by the titanic struggle in which the american republic saved its life is the manner in which its armies were levied and when the occasion for their employment was over were dismissed though there were periods when recruiting was slow and expensive yet there were others when some crying necessity for troops was apparent that showed almost incredible speed and efficiency in the supply of men 
mr stanton in his report for eighteen hundred and sixty five says after the disasters on the peninsula in eighteen hundred and sixty two over eighty thousand troops were enlisted organized armed equipped and sent into the field in less than a month sixty thousand troops have repeatedly gone to the field within four weeks and ninety thousand infantry were sent to the armies from the five states of ohio indiana illinois iowa and wisconsin within twenty days this certainly shows a wealth of resources nothing less than imperial and a power of commanding the physical and moral forces of the nation which has rarely been paralleled even more important by way of instruction and example was the lesson given the nations by the quick and noiseless dispersion of the enormous host when the war was done the best friends of the republic in europe feared for it in this crisis and those who disbelieved in the conservative power of democracy were loud in their prophecies of the trouble which would arise on the attempt to disband the army a million men with arms in their hands flushed with intoxicating victory led by officers schooled in battle loved and trusted were they not ready for any adventure was it reasonable to believe that they would consent to disband and go to work again at the bidding of a few men in black coats at washington especially after lincoln was dead could the tailor from tennessee direct these myriads of warriors to lay down their arms and melt away into the everyday life of citizens in america there was no anxiety on this score among the friends of the union without giving the subject a thought they knew there was no danger the war had been made to execute the laws and to save the national existence and when those objects were attained there was no thought among the soldiers from the general to the humblest file closer but to wait for the expected orders from the civil authorities for their disbandment the orders came as a mere matter of course and were executed with a thoroughness and rapidity which then seemed also a matter of course but which will appear more and more wonderful to succeeding generations the muster out began on the twenty ninth of april before lincoln was born to his grave before davis was caught before the rebels of the trans mississippi had ceased uttering their boasts of eternal defiance first the new recruits next the veterans whose terms were nearly expired next those expensive corps the cavalry and artillery and so on in regular order sherman's laurel-crowned army was the first to complete its muster out and the heroic army of the potomac was not far behind it these veterans of hundreds of battlefields were soon found mingled in all the pursuits of civic activity by the seventh of august six hundred and forty one thousand troops had become citizens by the middle of november over eight hundred thousand had been mustered out without a fancy in any mind that there was anything else to do the navy department had not waited for the return of peace to begin the reduction of expenses as soon as fort fisher fell the retrenchment began and before grant started on his last campaign considerable progress had been made in that direction by the first of may the squadrons were reduced one half and in july but thirty steamers comprised the entire blockading squadron on the atlantic and the gulf the potomac and mississippi flotillas were wholly discontinued in another month when mr wells made his annual report in december he could say there were in the several blockading squadrons in january last exclusive of other duty four hundred and seventy one vessels and two thousand four hundred and fifty five guns there are now but twenty nine vessels remaining on the coast carrying two hundred and ten guns exclusive of howitzers superfluous vessels were sold by hundreds and the money covered into the treasury thousands of the officers and sailors who had patriotically left the merchant service to fight under the national flag went back to the pursuits of peace for the purposes of pacification and the re-establishment of the national authority the country was divided into five grand divisions that of the atlantic commanded by meade the mississippi by sherman the gulf by sheridan the tennessee by thomas and the pacific by halleck these again were subdivided into nineteen departments and we print here the names of the generals commanding them for the last time as a roll of the men who survived the war most favored by fortune and their own merits hooker hancock augur ord stoneman palmer j m pope terry schofield sickles steedman foster j g wood 
t j wood r c canby wright reynolds j j steele mcdowell the success or failure of these soldiers in administering the trust confided to them their relations to the people among whom they were stationed and to the president who succeeded to the vacant chair of lincoln form no part of the story we have attempted to tell on the thirteenth of june the president proclaimed the insurrection at an end in the state of tennessee it was not until the second day of april eighteen hundred and sixty six that he proclaimed a state of peace as existing in the rest of the united states and then he accepted the state of texas on the twentieth of august in the same year he made his final proclamation announcing the re-establishment of the national authority in texas and thereupon he concluded i do further proclaim that the said insurrection is at an end and that peace order tranquillity and civil authority now exist in and throughout the whole of the united states of america thus the war ended the carnage and the waste of it had surpassed the darkest forebodings the most reckless prophecies on the union side two million two hundred thousand men had enlisted on the confederate about one million of these one hundred and ten thousand union soldiers were killed or mortally wounded in battle a quarter of a million died of other causes the total of deaths by the war on the northern side amounted to three hundred and sixty thousand two hundred and eighty two the number of the confederate dead cannot be accurately ascertained it ranges between two hundred and fifty thousand and three hundred thousand the expense of the war to the union over and above the ordinary expenses of the government was about three billion two hundred and fifty million dollars to the confederacy and less than half that amount about one billion five hundred million dollars it seems a disheartening paradox to the lovers of peace that all this homicide and spoil gave only a new impulse to the growth and the wealth of the nation we have seen how the quick eye of lincoln recognized the fact on the very night of election that the voting strength of the country was greater in eighteen hundred and sixty four than it had been in eighteen hundred and sixty and the census of eighteen hundred and seventy showed a prodigious advance in prosperity and population the thirty one million four hundred and forty three thousand three hundred and twenty one of eighteen hundred and sixty had in the ten troubled years of war and reconstruction increased to thirty eight million five hundred and fifty eight thousand three hundred and seventy one and the wealth of the country had waxed in an astonishing proportion from sixteen billion one hundred and fifty nine million six hundred and sixteen thousand sixty eight dollars to thirty billion sixty eight million five hundred and eighteen thousand five hundred and seven dollars even the reconquered states shared in this enormous progress End of chapter seventeen Chapter 18 of Abraham Lincoln A History, Volume 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln A History, Volume 10, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 18 Lincoln's Fame. The death of Lincoln awoke all over the world a quick and deep emotion of grief and admiration if he had died in the days of doubt and gloom which preceded his re-election he would have been sincerely mourned and praised by the friends of the union but its enemies would have curtly dismissed him as one of the necessary and misguided victims of sectional hate they would have used his death to justify their malevolent forebodings to point the moral of new lectures on the instability of democracies but as he had fallen in the moment of a stupendous victory the halo of a radiant success enveloped his memory and dazzled the eyes even of his most hostile critics that portion of the press of england and the continent which had persistently vilified him now joined in the universal chorus of elegiac praise Footnote. one of the finest poems on the occasion of his death was that in which the london punch made its manly recantation of the slanders with which it had pursued him for four years Quote, beside this corpse that bears for winding sheet the stars and stripes he lived to rear anew between the mourners at his head and feet say scurrile jester is there room for you 
Yes, he had lived to shame me for my sneer, to lame my pencil and to confute my pen, to make me own this hind of prince's peer, this rail splitter, a true born king of men. End quote. End footnote. Cabinets and courts, which had been cold or unfriendly, sent their messages of condolence. The French government, spurred on by their liberal opponents, took prompt measures to express their admiration for his character and their horror at his taking off. In the Senate and the Chamber of Deputies, the imperialists and the republicans vied with each other in utterances of grief and of praise. The emperor and the empress sent their personal condolences to Mrs. Lincoln. In England, there was perhaps a trifle of self-consciousness at the bottom of the official expressions of sympathy. The Foreign Office searched the records for precedents, finding nothing which suited the occasion since the assassination of Henri IV. The sterling English character could not, so gracefully as the courtiers of Napoleon III, bend to praise one who had been treated almost as an enemy for so long. When Sir George Grey opened his dignified and pathetic speech in the House of Commons by saying that a majority of the people of England sympathized with the North, he was greeted with loud protestations and denials on the part of those who favored the Confederacy. But his references to Lincoln's virtues were cordially received, and when he said that the Queen had written to Mrs. Lincoln with her own hand, as a widow to a widow, the House broke out in loud cheering. Mr. Disraeli spoke on behalf of the Conservatives with his usual dexterity and with a touch of factitious feeling. Quote, there is, he said, in the character of the victim, and even in the accessories of his last moments, something so homely and innocent that it takes the question, as it were, out of all the pomp of history and the ceremonial of diplomacy. It touches the heart of nations and appeals to the domestic sentiment of mankind. End quote. In the House of Lords, the matter was treated with characteristic reticence. The speech of Lord Russell was full of that rugged truthfulness, that unbending integrity of spirit, which appeared at the time to disguise his real friendliness to America, and which was only the natural expression of a mind extraordinarily upright, and English to the verge of caricature. Lord Derby followed him in a speech of curious elegance, the object of which was rather to launch a polished shaft against his opponents than to show honour to the dead president, and the address proposed by the government was voted. While these reserved and careful public proceedings were going on, the heart of England was expressing its sympathy with the kindred beyond sea by its thousand organs of utterance in the press, the resolutions of municipal bodies, the pulpit, and the platform. In Germany, the same manifestations were seen of official expressions of sympathy from royalty and its ministers, and of heartfelt affection and grief from the people and their representatives. Otto von Bismarck, then at the beginning of the events which have made his career so illustrious, gave utterance to the courteous regrets of the King of Prussia, the eloquent deputy, William Leuwe, from his place in the house, made a brief and touching speech. Quote, the man, he said, who accomplished such great deeds from the simple desire conscientiously to perform his duty, the man who never wished to be more nor less than the most faithful servant of his people, will find his own glorious place in the pages of history. In the deepest reverence, I bow my head before this modest greatness, and I think it is especially agreeable to the spirit of our own nation, with its deep inner life and admiration of self-sacrificing devotion, and effort after the ideal, to pay the tribute of veneration to such greatness, exalted as it is, by simplicity and modesty. End quote. Two hundred and fifty members of the chamber signed an address to the American minister in Berlin, full of the cordial sympathy and admiration felt not only for the dead president, but for the national cause by the people of Germany. Quote, you are aware, they said, that Germany has looked with pride and joy on the thousands of her sons who in this struggle have placed themselves so resolutely on the side of law and right. You have seen with what pleasure the victories of the Union have been hailed, and how confident the faith in the final triumph of the great cause has 
and the restoration of the Union in all its greatness has ever been, even in the midst of calamity. End quote. Working men's clubs, artisans' unions, sent numberless addresses, not merely expressive of sympathy, but conveying singularly just appreciations of the character and career of Lincoln. His death seemed to have marked a step in the education of the people everywhere. In fact, it was among the common people of the entire civilized world that the most genuine and spontaneous manifestations of sorrow and appreciation were produced, and to this fact we attribute the sudden and solid foundation of Lincoln's fame. It requires years, perhaps centuries, to build the structure of a reputation which rests upon the opinion of those distinguished for learning or intelligence. The progress of opinion from the few to the many is slow and painful. But in the case of Lincoln, the many imposed their opinion all at once. He was canonized, as he lay on his bier, by the irresistible decree of countless millions. The greater part of the aristocracy of England thought little of him, but the burst of grief from the English people silenced in an instant every discordant voice. It would have been as imprudent to speak slightingly of him in London as it was in New York. Especially among the dissenters was honor and reverence shown to his name. The humbler people instinctively felt that their order had lost its wisest champion. Not only among those of Saxon blood was this outburst of emotion seen. In France, a national manifestation took place, which the government disliked, but did not think it wise to suppress. The students of Paris marched in a body to the American legation to express their sympathy. A two-cent subscription was started to strike a massive gold medal. The money was soon raised, but the committee was forced to have the work done in Switzerland. A committee of French liberals brought the medal to the American minister to be sent to Mrs. Lincoln. Quote, Tell her, said Eugène Pelletan, the heart of France is in that little box. End quote. The inscription had a double sense. While honoring the dead Republican, it struck at the empire. Quote, Lincoln, the honest man, abolished slavery, re-established the Union, saved the Republic without veiling the statue of liberty. End quote. Everywhere on the continent, the same swift apotheosis of the people's hero was seen. An Austrian deputy said to the writer, quote, Among my people, his memory has already assumed superhuman proportions. He has become a myth, a type of ideal democracy. End quote. Almost before the earth closed over him, he began to be the subject of fable. The Freemasons of Europe generally regard him as one of them. His portrait in Masonic garb is often displayed, yet he was not one of that brotherhood. The spiritualists claim him as their most illustrious adept, but he was not a spiritualist. And there is hardly a sect in the Western world, from the Calvinist to the atheist, but affects to believe he was of their opinion. A collection of the expressions of sympathy and condolence which came to Washington from foreign governments, associations, and public bodies of all sorts was made by the State Department and afterward published by order of Congress. It forms a large quarto of a thousand pages, and embraces the utterances of grief and regret from every country under the sun, in almost every language spoken by man. But, admired and venerated as he was in Europe, he was best understood and appreciated at home. It is not to be denied that in his case, as in that of all heroic personages who occupy a great place in history, a certain element of legend mingles with his righteous fame. He was a man, in fact, especially liable to legend. We have been told by farmers in central Illinois that the brown thrush did not sing for a year after he died. He was gentle and merciful, and therefore he seems, in a certain class of annals, to have passed all his time in soothing misfortune and pardoning crime. He had more than his share of the shrewd native humor, and therefore the loose jest books of two centuries have been ransacked for anecdotes to be attributed to him. He was a great and powerful lover of mankind, especially of those not favored by fortune. One night he had a dream, which he repeated the next morning to the writer of these lines, which quaintly illustrates his unpretending and kindly democracy. He was in some great assembly. The people made a lane to let him pass. 
He is a common-looking fellow, someone said. Lincoln, in his dream, turned to his critic and replied, in his Quaker phrase, Friend, the Lord prefers common-looking people. That is why he made so many of them. He that abases himself shall be exalted, because Lincoln kept himself in such constant sympathy with the common people, whom he respected too highly to flatter or mislead, he was rewarded by a reverence and a love hardly ever given to a human being. Among the humble working people of the South, whom he had made free, this veneration and affection easily passed into the supernatural. At a religious meeting among the Negroes of the Sea Islands, a young man expressed the wish that he might see Lincoln. A gray-headed Negro rebuked the rash aspiration. Quote, no man see Lincoln. Lincoln walk as Jesus walk. No man see Lincoln. End quote. But leaving aside these fables, which are a natural enough expression of a popular awe and love, it seems to us no more just estimate of Lincoln's relation to his time has ever been made, nor perhaps ever will be, than that uttered by one of the wisest and most American of thinkers, Ralph Waldo Emerson, a few days after the assassination. We cannot forbear quoting a few words of this remarkable discourse, which shows how Lincoln seemed to the greatest of his contemporaries. Quote, a plain man of the people, an extraordinary fortune attended him. Lord Bacon says, manifest virtues procure reputation, occult ones fortune. His occupying the chair of state was a triumph of the good sense of mankind and of the public conscience. He grew according to the need. His mind mastered the problem of the day. As the problem grew, so did his comprehension of it. Rarely was a man so fitted to the event. It cannot be said that there is any exaggeration of his worth. If ever a man was fairly tested, he was. There was no lack of resistance, nor of slander, nor of ridicule. And what an occasion was the whirlwind of the war! Here was no place for holiday magistrate, or fair-weather sailor. The new pilot was hurried to the helm in a tornado. In four years, four years of battle days, his endurance, his fertility of resources, his magnanimity, were sorely tried and never found wanting. There by his courage, his justice, his even temper, his fertile counsel, his humanity, he stood a heroic figure in the center of a heroic epoch. He is the true history of the American people in his time, the true representative of this continent, father of his country, the pulse of twenty millions throbbing in his heart, the thought of their minds articulated by his tongue. End quote. The quick instinct by which the world recognized him, even at the moment of his death, as one of its greatest men, was not deceived. It has been confirmed by the sober thought of a quarter of a century. The writers of each nation compare him with their first popular hero. The French find points of resemblance in him to Henri IV. The Dutch liken him to William of Orange. The cruel stroke of murder and treason, by which all three perished at the height of their power, naturally suggests the comparison, which is strangely justified in both cases, though the two princes were so widely different in character. Lincoln had the wit the bonhomie, the keen practical insight into affairs of the Béarnais, and the tyrannous moral sense, the wide comprehension, the heroic patience of the Dutch patriot, whose motto might have served equally well for the American president, saeves tranquillus in undis. European historians speak of him in words reserved for the most illustrious names. Marle d'Aubigné says, quote, the name of Lincoln will remain one of the greatest that history has to inscribe on its annals. Henri Martin predicts nothing less than a universal apotheosis. Quote, this man will stand out in the traditions of his country and the world as an incarnation of the people and of modern democracy itself. End quote. Emilio Castellar, in an oration against slavery in the Spanish Cortes, called him quote, the humblest of the humble before his conscience greatest of the great before history. In this country, where millions still live who were his contemporaries, and thousands who knew him personally, 
where the envies and jealousies which dog the footsteps of success still linger in the hearts of a few where journals still exist that loaded his name for four years with daily calumny and writers of memoirs vainly try to make themselves important by belittling him his fame has become as universal as the air as deeply rooted as the hills the faint discords are not heard in the wide chorus that hails him second to none and equalled by washington alone the eulogies of him form a special literature preachers poets soldiers and statesmen employ the same phrases of unconditional love and reverence men speaking with the authority of fame use unqualified superlatives lowell in an immortal ode calls him quote, new birth of our new soil the first american end quote general sherman says quote, of all the men i ever met he seemed to possess more of the elements of greatness combined with goodness than any other end quote. general grant after having met the rulers of almost every civilized country on earth said lincoln impressed him as the greatest intellectual force with which he had ever come in contact he is spoken of with scarcely less of enthusiasm by the more generous and liberal spirits among those who revolted against his election and were vanquished by his power general longstreet calls him quote, the greatest man of rebellion times the one matchless among forty millions for the peculiar difficulties of the period end quote. an eminent southern orator referring to our mixed northern and southern ancestry says quote, from the union of those colonists, from the straightening of their purposes and the crossing of their blood, slowly perfecting through a century, came he who stands as the first typical American, the first who comprehended within himself all the strength and gentleness, all the majesty and grace of this republic, Abraham Lincoln. End quote. It is not difficult to perceive the basis of this sudden and worldwide fame, nor rash to predict its indefinite duration. There are two classes of men whose names are more enduring than any monument, the great writers, and the men of great achievement, the founders of states, the conquerors. Lincoln has the singular fortune to belong to both these categories. Upon these broad and stable foundations his renown is securely built. Nothing would have more amazed him while he lived than to hear himself called a man of letters, but this age has produced few greater writers. We are only recording here the judgment of his peers. Emerson ranks him with Aesop and Bilpai in his lighter moods, and says, quote, The weight and penetration of many passages in his letters, messages, and speeches, hidden now by the very closeness of their application to the moment, are destined to a wide fame. What pregnant definitions! What unerring common sense! what foresight, and on great occasions, what lofty and more than national, what human tone. His brief speech at Gettysburg will not easily be surpassed by words on any recorded occasion. End quote. His style extorted the high praise of French academicians. Montalembert commended it as a model for the imitation of princes. Many of his phrases form part of the common speech of mankind. It is true that, in his writings, the range of subjects is not great. He is concerned chiefly with the political problems of the time, and the moral considerations involved in them. But the range of treatment is remarkably wide. It runs from the wit, the gay humor, the florid eloquence of his stump speeches, to the marvelous sententiousness and brevity of the letter to Greeley, and the address at Gettysburg, and the sustained and lofty grandeur of the second inaugural the more his writings are studied in connection with the important transactions of his age the higher will his reputation stand in the opinion of the lettered class but the men of study and research are never numerous and it is principally as a man of action that the world at large will regard him it is the story of his objective life that will forever touch and hold the heart of mankind his birthright was privation and ignorance not peculiar to his family but the universal environment of his place and time he burst through those enchaining conditions by the force of native genius and will vice had no temptation for him his course was as naturally upward 
as the Skylarks. He won, against all conceivable obstacles, a high place in an exacting profession, and an honorable position in public and private life. He became the foremost representative of a party founded on an uprising of the national conscience against a secular wrong, and thus came to the awful responsibilities of power in a time of terror and gloom. He met them with incomparable strength and virtue. Caring for nothing but the public good, free from envy or jealous fears, he surrounded himself with the leading men of his party, his most formidable rivals in public esteem, and through four years of stupendous difficulties he was head and shoulders above them all in the vital qualities of wisdom, foresight, knowledge of men, and thorough comprehension of measures. Personally opposed, as the radicals claim, by more than half of his own party in Congress, and bitterly denounced and maligned by his open adversaries, he yet bore himself with such extraordinary discretion and skill that he obtained for the government all the legislation it required, and so impressed himself upon the national mind that without personal effort or solicitation he became the only possible candidate of his party for re-election, and was chosen by an almost unanimous vote of the electoral colleges. His qualities would have rendered his administration illustrious, even in time of peace. But when we consider that in addition to the ordinary work of the executive office, he was forced to assume the duties of commander-in-chief of the national forces engaged in the most complex and difficult war of modern times, the greatness of spirit, as well as the intellectual strength he evinced in that capacity, is nothing short of prodigious. After times will wonder, not at the few and unimportant mistakes he may have committed, but at the intuitive knowledge of his business that he displayed. We would not presume to express a personal opinion in this matter. We use the testimony only of the most authoritative names. General W. T. Sherman has repeatedly expressed the admiration and surprise with which he has read Mr. Lincoln's correspondence with his generals, and his opinion of the remarkable correctness of his military views. General W. F. Smith says, quote, I have long held the opinion that at the close of the war Mr. Lincoln was the superior of his generals in his comprehension of the effect of strategic movements and the proper method of following up victories to their legitimate conclusions. End quote. General J. H. Wilson holds the same opinion, and Colonel Robert N. Scott, in whose lamented death the army lost one of its most vigorous and best trained intellects, frequently called Mr. Lincoln the ablest strategist of the war. To these qualifications of high literary excellence and easy practical mastery of affairs of transcendent importance, we must add as an explanation of his immediate and worldwide fame his possession of certain moral qualities rarely combined in such high degree in one individual. His heart was so tender that he would dismount from his horse in a forest to replace in their nest young birds which had fallen by the roadside. He could not sleep at night if he knew that a soldier boy was under sentence of death. He could not, even at the bidding of duty or policy, refuse the prayer of age or helplessness and distress. Children instinctively loved him. They never found his rugged features ugly, his sympathies were quick and seemingly unlimited. He was absolutely without prejudice of class or condition. Frederick Douglass says that he was the only man of distinction he ever met who never reminded him by word or manner of his color. He was as just and generous to the rich and well-born as to the poor and humble, a thing rare among politicians. He was tolerant even of evil, Though no man can have lived with a loftier scorn of meanness and selfishness, he yet recognized their existence and counted with them. He said one day, with a flash of cynical wisdom worthy of La Rochefoucauld, that honest statesmanship was the employment of individual meanness for the public good. He never asked perfection of anyone. He did not even insist for others upon the high standards he set up for himself. At a time before the word was invented, he was the first of opportunists. With the fire of a reformer and a martyr in his heart, he yet proceeded by the ways of cautious and practical statecraft. He always worked with things as they were, 
while never relinquishing the desire and effort to make them better. To a hope which saw the delectable mountains of absolute justice and peace in the future, to a faith that God in his own time would give to all men the things convenient to them, he added a charity which embraced in its deep bosom all the good and the bad, all the virtues and the infirmities of men, and a patience like that of nature, which in its vast and fruitful activity knows neither haste nor rest. A character like this is among the precious heirlooms of the Republic, and by a special good fortune every part of the country has an equal claim and pride in it. Lincoln's blood came from the veins of New England emigrants, of Middle State Quakers, of Virginia planters, of Kentucky pioneers. He himself was one of the men who grew up with the earliest growth of the Great West. Every jewel of his mind or his conduct sheds radiance on each portion of the nation. The marvelous symmetry and balance of his own intellect and character may have owed something to this varied environment of his race, and they may fitly typify the variety and solidity of the Republic. It may not be unreasonable to hope that his name and his renown may be forever a bond of union to the country which he loved with an affection so impartial and served in life and in death with such entire devotion. End of chapter 18 Recording by Owen Cook In Potawatomi Seated Land and in a state known as the Land of Lincoln. End of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 10, by John Hay and John George Nicolay.